Okay. Um, welcome to our last colloquium speech of this quarter. Um, it's my really uh, great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, uh, Pablo Tapia. He's a member of technical staff right, in uh, T-Mobile, our good neighbor right, in Bellevue. Okay. Uh, Pablo has been uh, in this uh, uh, 3G and also this H HSPA Plus uh, industry uh, for about 12 years after he got his degree uh, from Spain. And he was one of these uh, pioneers uh, to uh, set up, for example, the Nokia Research Lab in Beijing and also the uh, Nokia Research Lab in Denmark. And after that, seven years ago, he joined T-Mobile. And after that, he has been in charge of a lot of these uh, HSPA performance and evaluation, as well as in charge of a lot of uh, LTE, LTE plus, and also quality of service type of uh, research uh, in uh, uh, T-Mobile. So today, he's going to share with us a lot of uh, his personal uh, observation and his personal experience. Especially, he is also one of these uh, key authors uh, uh, writing the book about the HSPA, uh, which is one of, right now, the dominating technology uh, in 3G. So let's welcome uh, Pablo. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, and thank you for uh, attending. Uh, my name is Pablo Tapia, and I work uh, for T-Mobile. And the presentation today is, is going to be an overview uh, of the wireless uh, ecosystem. What, what are we coming from and where are we heading? And as an operator, we are in a unique position to observe the, the forces that are behind this industry. Uh, we are suffering many of the challenges. Uh, so what I will be doing during this presentation is uh, kind of uh, share with you some of the challenges we are seeing, what are the, the main trends in the industry, uh, and hopefully also point out some uh, nice areas of research that you would like to probably look into. So T-Mobile USA uh, is uh, right around the corner. If you cross an empty, <laughs> you'll see the buildings over there. The headquarters uh, are in Bellevue, and we are about uh, 42,000 employees. Uh, about 5,000 of them are here in Washington State. Uh, we are the fourth larger operator in the US with uh, about uh, 33 million subscribers, uh, and uh, we, have, uh, we have demonstrated the technology leadership in, in different areas. You know, as, as the fourth operator, we are forced to innovate in different areas. Uh, maybe we don't have the resources that the bigger operators do, but we are usually trying to find uh, key differentiators on how to serve our customers in a better way. So, for example, we were the, the first operator in the world to launch an Android phones. I think not many people know that because Verizon has made a lot of noise with the Droid, but we probably have the most uh, large Android uh, base in the US. Uh, we, we, we have been heavily uh, promoting the HSPA Plus technology, which we deployed in 2009, uh, and we have been growing at fo our footprint to cover right now about 200 million uh, Americans with uh, I mean, significantly higher speeds than what the other 3G operators were, were offering. We have been also uh, pioneers in, in the areas of Wi-Fi calling with our UMA service uh, with which you could, uh, once you get at home, use your, use your Wi-Fi network and don't consume minutes. Uh, so that was very popular. And in the last uh, couple of years, we've been, uh, we've been very aggressive with uh, video call uh, over cellular. So you, can, you have seen other operators launching video call services, but they've been always being constrained to, to Wi-Fi. And Wi-Fi doesn't have the problems that you find over, over cellular. So this, this has been really a challenge and, and an area where we have been uh, heavily uh, investigating. And, Hopefully, we'll be collaborating as well with, uh, with this university on, on further research. And IPv6, uh, you know, we, we launched a beta version of IPv6 uh, last year, and, and our network is, uh, is going to be ready 
full IPv6 ready in all the three technologies by mid this year. <clears throat> so I just wanted to kind of go back in time a little bit and, and put things in perspective. So I've been in the industry for 12 years and really, that, that is not a long time, but during these 12 years, a lot of changes have happened, right? So I remember this, this was uh, my second phone, uh, and we were all so excited because it was a digital phone. You know, before this, we had a brick phone that was analog, and with this, you could do texting, and people were really <laughs> so excited about this. But from this moment on, when GSM appeared, the, the, the industry has been really improving year over year at a really fast pace. So, you know, a couple of years later, the first camera phones appeared with color screen. Again, everybody was very excited. Then, you know, in 2004, I guess some of you may remember the revolution of the Razer. So, you know, the new designs in the cell phones were appearing. You had uh, some data with uh, devices like uh, the Sidekick uh, that was very popular in T-Mobile. And really the key year has been 2007, 2008, when the new smartphones have appeared. So before this point, everybody in the wireless industry was kind of uh, talking about oh, how important data services are going to be in the wireless industry, how it is going to put a lot of strain in the network. People were in 2000, 2002, they were heavily investing in, in putting 3G networks in, in the ground to cope with that theoretical data demand. But in reality, it only happened when we had the right device, which was the touchscreen smartphones, you know, the iPhone, the, the G phone uh, from Android. And from that moment on, there has been really a, an explosion in the number of devices. Everybody has joined the, the race for providing better experiences on the device, better experiences on the network. And it has been really a, a, you know, a stretch for operators to cope up with the sudden demand that these devices are putting on the network. <clears throat> and this is only the beginning. So just, you know, I'm putting here some industry uh, forecast for the next five years. Uh, as you can see, the smartphones are becoming very popular. So much that, you know, right now we are selling, in general, in the US, more smartphones than regular phones. So people go to the shop and, and they don't want a voice phone, they just want a smartphone. And what happens when you get a smartphone is not that you only get a cool device, but you use it a lot more than, than with regular phones. So these are statistics uh, by a study by uh, Pew Research Center that shows how much more tendency to use services in general have smartphone users are compared, as compared to regular users. So what these two together translates into is an explosive amount of data transmission over the network. And guess what? <laughs> we are in the middle. We are the operators. We need to supply the pipe to serve this data demand. So. Oops. So, what are the what are the ma the main challenges that this increased data demand is posing in our network? So, capacity. Uh, network capacity is a big problem, as you have seen. There's there's going to be a lot more data flowing through the network. We have the same resources, so we need to think of ways to, to serve this amount of data with the same network, with the same engineers. And, you know, that's going to be a problem. But it's not only the amount of data that is flowing through the network. Now, the problem is that the expectations from data services have really gone up. Before, you know, when we had these devices, you know, this was the first uh, 3G device we were testing here in the, in the US it was kind of a brick. And you were happy if you, know, you click on the web page and the web page downloaded within one minute. Right? You were happy because you had data service. 
Now the expectation is, is totally different. You want to have a smartphone, and that smartphone needs to be able to provide a snappy experience. It has to be able to, to provide the services that you see in your home internet, but in a, in a mobile environment. And as you know, you're studying, <laughs> many of you probably, is studying RF engineering. The mobile environment uh, is really, really difficult to, <laughs> to predict. So that puts a lot of strain into how much capacity you can, you can, really, uh, you can really serve with a certain quality of service. Right? And then yet another challenge, and this is, uh, this is economic in nature, is, well, the trend in, in revenues is actually kind of following this paradigm where people are less interested around voice and more interested about data. Mm -hmm. So the ARPU trends in the US are, are so that uh, they are going to meet at one point. Actually, data will, will be higher at one point because people are really not valuing that much the, the voice service. And the problem is data services consume much more than voice. So at the end of the day, what's, what's happening is that they're squeezing uh, our networks. So in a nutshell, what, what are the key engineering solutions we can do to, uh, to cope with a capacity demand? Well, the first one, straightforward, say, okay, let's deploy more units. You know, let's deploy more base stations, let's uh, get more spectrum, and that way you, you can cope with more data flowing through your network. Uh, the problem is spectrum is really, really expensive. You know, it's in the billions of dollars. Plus, even if you wanted to buy it, there is no spectrum available. You know, the US has one of the lowest uh, spectrum allocation per subscriber in the world. If you compare to Europe, for example, we're like a one-tenth of what they have. So really, we don't have so many available resources. So we need to start thinking about other things. One, of the, one possibility is using Wi-Fi, right? Try, you know, Wi-Fi spectrum is pretty large. It's open, it's free. So we could try and offload some of the traffic into Wi-Fi. But there are some challenges with that. Uh, that is, you know, you lose the control over the quality of the service once you do that. There are a lot of uh, strains on battery life. But I believe that is a very hot topic that during the coming years, we're going to kind of clear out. And if we find the proper methods to, to make Wi-Fi offload uh, feasible, this probably will fly. But in the meantime, we need to do something else. Since we don't have a spectrum, the only thing we can do is increase the spectrum efficiency, meaning we need to put more bytes uh, through the same amount of, uh, or through the same channel. And the ways to do that is, well, using higher modulations, uh, using more antennas, using better access technologies like uh, OFDM, etc. So there is a global migration from uh, 3G uh, and evolved uh, networks into uh, HSPA plus globally and then later into LTE. And in the US we are we're kind of a very special situation because we are kind of leading the LTE development in the world. If you look at the rest of the countries in the world, LTE is still, you know, it's in the plans but still not a reality. Here in the US, LTE is, is pushing forward very, uh, very heavily. And, uh, you know, as T-Mobile, we have been uh, pushing the HSPA plus technology because we believe that's, that's the right thing to do for the, for the medium short term. But LTE definitely will do it. And we have just announced plans to, to deploy an LTE network uh, during the coming uh, few years. But, Access technology it's by itself is not enough, right? So you can put a very nice technology, and if you, you know, if you put one sector pointing at each other, that kills the capacity. So oftentimes we find that you, you have a very capable network technology, but you are doing a very poor RF design, meaning that you really don't understand how the RF uh, behaves. And if you don't understand the effect of interference, for example, into your overall network capacity, then you're actually hurting your spectral efficiency. So RF optimization techniques 
are key uh, for the operators to improve uh, our capacity or you know, our capability of satis satisfying the demand. And you know, heterogeneous network as a last uh, resort is something, is, you know, is a new hype in the industry. Everybody says, okay, well, in the next few years, you're gonna have, I don't know, 20 pico cells in one macro cell because the theory is good. You know, you, you want to put your base station where your traffic is. That's the best way to improve your SINR, and hence, you know, you improve your throughput, your bit rate. The problem is there are a lot of practicalities around that that still have not been sorted out. So heterogeneous networks is a nice concept, but I think it's not practical for the short term. Okay, so how does new technologies improve the capacity? This is just a, a kind of a, an example of what you can do if you change your air interface a transmission scheme or if you add more antennas. So adding more antennas is something that is very powerful uh, and has only recently started to, uh, to pan out because before it was complicated to have handsets that supported two antennas. Now that's becoming mainstream. Uh, and then operators, you know, especially MIMO techniques were very complicated and processive intensive. So, so MIMO, which uh, allows you to transmit uh, up to twice the amount of information uh, through the same channel using a special diversity, uh, special multiplexing, uh, it's, it's, it's a reality today. LTE uh, included MIMO techniques as mandatory in their, in their terminals. So, so the, the default, when you go from HSPA plus to LTE, is really to have a two by two configuration. And that not only improves your peak rates, it also improves your uh, performance at the cell edge because you're using transmit diversity, which you know, it's another form of diversity and, and can combat uh, the, the shortcomings of the, of the RF environment. So you know, once you have new technologies, once you have higher MIMO schemes, you can really up to double the capacity of of your channel. But you know, being realistic, we are right now in this environment. LTE 4x4 is uh, still not there. Uh, there are no devices until probably mid next year. Uh, and you know, for the time being, we'll have to stay on this flavor. But this is good enough. You know, moving into an LTE path gives you the possibility to keep on improving your network uh, capacity. But again, it doesn't matter that you deploy LTE if you don't do it right. So no technology has the power of uh, eliminating interference. And, and this is a very basic law, I guess everybody in the information theory has uh, studied uh, Shannon, but really the capacity of your channel depends on, on your SINR, your signal to interference and noise ratio. If you have a very high uh, SINR, you know, you're able to transmit at higher modulations. You're able to put more bits per symbol through the same uh, channel bandwidth. But as, as soon as you start to have high noise or high interference, then you go down this curve and your throughput goes down. So what happens in, in cellular networks, and this is a, you know, just a law of physics, is the closer you are to your base station, the better your radio transmission is. You can have, if you're here, you can have a big uh, pipe just for yourself. You can transmit it with 64 QIM. Uh, you, can, you can use a special multiplexing, meaning you can transmit two or even four data streams at the same time. But as long as you start moving out, your SINR degrades and your capacity shrinks. So how is this important? Well. If you plan your base stations in a way that your users are here, then you're really killing your capacity. And this is why, you know, that's the whole concept about headnets. Headnets want to put people here next to the, next to the base station. But in general, 
when you do a macro design, you're, you want to, first of all, put the base stations in the right place, point them to the right place, and also avoid interference because these areas actually can, uh, they can shift back and forth depending on, on how much interference they're receiving from the neighboring cells. So this is an example of how you can uh, you know, get the same network and through RF optimization improve your, uh, your capacity. So in this particular example here, we have two sectors in a network. This was in Philadelphia. Uh, and we were driving around and we saw that there was a, a lot of uh, interference in that particular sector. When you have interference, your throughput goes down. So you start to look around, okay, what's going on? And then you find that maybe this uh, sector is pointing at this other sector, or maybe uh, the antenna tilt, meaning the antenna, uh, you know, or in, uh, well, how much you're uh, putting the antenna to the ground uh, may not be optimum. So by adjusting the RF design, you're, you're able to you know, an area which was suboptimum in terms of speed, you can bump your speed maybe by 20, 30, even 50 percent. So by doing that in a wider scale, you're, you're shifting your, your overall performance. And same thing about higher order modulation. So if you don't have good SINRs, your 64 QAM availability is going to suffer. So there, there was some, some tests we did here in the Seattle area where we're measuring what was the gain overall of 64 QAM, or what, how many, what percentage of the, of the locations you could get it. And in, you know, it gave us that about 25% of the, of the areas you could get 64 QAM, but you know, that results only in about 10% gain. We also did some analysis on other operators that are offering the same, and actually it was even worse. So, you know, these are very tricky things, and they, you know, fine-tuning these aspects require a deep knowledge of the RF environment, a deep knowledge of the technology, and worst of all is you have to go side by side and do this. Now, this is a lot of work. So there is, there is a new thing coming up uh, with uh, 4G technologies that is called self-organizing networks. And self-organizing networks are methods that allow us to kind of create smart algorithms that think, take care of these aspects automatically. And this is going to be, you know, the next part of the presentation. So why, you know, what is SON and why, why are we so excited? I think all the operator community is very excited about this. What's happening is we are deploying because we need to satisfy the capacity, we need to satisfy the user demands for better services. So you end up deploying multiple technologies that you still need to operate with the same amount of people. So if we are 4,000 engineers in T-Mobile, we're not going to probably increase the number of engineers if we deploy another network. It's just going to be us who need to deal with the existing GSM, with HSPA and LTE. Now, how do you do that? Well, you need some form of automation on the network to, to free up some time from the engineer to, to take care of that. Plus, there are higher traffic volumes, and uh, as I mentioned, if you want to extract higher capacity, you really need to fine tune the network. So you cannot do this. I mean, I was doing some optimization myself. Uh, if you have 100 uh, sites, you know, you can, you can really spend a lot of time doing that. So that's not scalable. You need to find automatic ways to do this. Plus, once you start to have more complex network technologies, then your number of base stations are going to multiply. So it's really, you know, it's really impossible. And this is why Sony is, is becoming so important. We are still in the earliest stages, as you will see, but it's a very promising area for, for operators. This is kind of a, you know, very clear why, why do we want to, to automate the network, right? First of all, it will reduce the amount of time we spend uh, operating the network, and that can free up time for us to do 
other things that are better used. They are fast and accurate. They, you know, they, they work in real time. They just get information straight from the network, and if, they, if there is a need to do something, they will push the new parameters back into the network so that the response time to any particular problem or, or an optimization required is, is much better. Plus, you could define methods that are adapting to, to, uh, to traffic conditions. So, uh, as you may know, traffic changes in different hours of the day. For example, if you have uh, people working in the downtown areas of a city, and then they will move into the residential areas, you may want to have different uh, uh, optimization schemes in the network for those, uh, for those different times. And that will allow to, to do an optimum optimization of uh, radio resources, because then we can go into the sector level instead of just doing kind of network level uh, configurations. So self-organizing networks is a very active area in the 3GPP standards. 3GPP is the main body that standardizes uh, LTE technology as well as HSPA, GSM. Uh, and since 2007, there has been a lot of uh, effort put on defining certain key uh, zone algorithms. And some of examples uh, of these algorithms are automatic neighbor optimization, meaning that you just deploy your nodes and the network will automatically decide how do you need to create your neighbor relations with the other sectors. There are algorithms to balance the load between sectors. So if one sector gets overloaded, then you can adjust the, uh, the cell offsets to shed some traffic into the neighboring sites. Uh, there are methods to optimize your handover performance. So you maybe play with the hysteresis values of, uh, of the handovers to make sure that you're getting, uh, you know, a better reliable handovers into other sectors. And then there are more advanced things like uh, RF coverage and capacity optimization that I'll, I'll cover a little bit uh, later. And, you know, this is still work in progress. Uh, the more complicated the network becomes, the more of these uh, uh, algorithms will be defined. And this is one example from uh, one of the algorithms, uh, the automatic neighbor definition. Uh, this, is a, this is a trial network uh, that uh, our parent company has in, in Europe. And they were running a, a trial with two different vendors testing, okay, we, they deployed the network without any neighbors defined, and they took a phone and drove around the area. And they were measuring, well, does the phone drop at all? Uh, are the handovers successful? Uh, how long does it take to take the handover? And, and here you can find some of the statistics. So 100% handover success rate, handover time between 40 and 180 milliseconds, depending on what is the interface you're using for that. Uh, and really, the most important part of all this is that we are removing all the work that, uh, that is required on the operator side to, to optimize this, uh, this problem. And this seems like a very simple, very simple thing to do. Uh, but you know what? This is one of the major hurdles we have in, in our networks today, is defining neighbors, making sure that the neighbors are there, that there are no missing neighbors, that you are defining the proper neighbors. And it is complicated because networks change every day. Every day we're putting new sites here. There is one site that has an outage there. So it is very hard to, to do that uh, on a real-time basis. With this kind of automatic algorithms, you are taking care of that part of the problem. So this is a very, very important thing for us. And then this is, is, these are really the coverage and capacity optimization methods are, are very promising uh, because, as I mentioned before, if we can ad adjust the, the way the SINR is distributed in the network, you're really 
improving your overall capacity. So even if you keep the same rate of technology, by improving your RF, you're, you're really getting much more out of that network. So uh, how do we do this? Well, 3GPP has defined certain standard procedures. Like they say, okay, uh, they define scenarios like, uh, like this one over here saying, okay, if there is a coverage hole and, uh, and this is detected through certain measurement reports, then the network shall do this, meaning the neighboring sectors have to compensate for that, for that hole. So then the, the infrastructure vendors will take this input and they will develop their own algorithm. So there is a lot of, a lot of areas here for, for research in terms of how do you do this? Because there is not a, a one algorithm to do this. There are multiple algorithms. Uh, and actually, when you design the algorithm in the lab, it's not going to work. You're going to have to go to the field, and it's going to, you're going to have to fine tune it uh, for one particular operator or one particular uh, network type. So a lot of uh, opportunities in this area adjusting the RF environment uh, on the fly, adjusting the antenna tilts, adjusting the powers of the base stations. Very, very promising. But SON is really not limited to the standards. So the standards are giving us, or you know, operators which uh, were the main uh, interested party behind self-organizing networks. We provide guidelines to the standards and say, well, we'd like these methods to be standardized and be implemented. And then the vendors go and say, yeah, I comply to this or not. But really, SON is a concept. It's not just limited to what the standards are defining. And there are so many possibilities to automate the network if you have the right framework in place. That you, know, you can apply this to any technology. It's not only LTE. You can do this for HSPA or even GSM. And here is one particular example of one trial that, uh, that we run with uh, an HSPA plus network. So we, we define an automatic algorithm that was, uh, uh, the objective was to increase the HSPA plus uh, quality, which are, you know, the measured by, by the channel quality indicator or CQI in the network. And as I mentioned earlier, CQI, which in reality is directly correlated with the SINR, results in higher capacity. So this algorithm really was looking after increasing the capacity of the system. And we let it run for a few days. This, these are iterative methods that learn from day to day, and they do uh, little changes here and there. And, and the results were very impressive in terms of reducing your overall cell overlap and increasing your, your uh, overall network quality, hence capacity. So, a lot of areas for operators to, to develop. As soon as we get, or as long as we have a framework in place, we can define our own algorithms because we are the ones that know what are the problems that we are facing. Vendors try to guess, but we are the ones that are there day by day. You know, there is a problem in a stadium, people cannot make calls, we know that's happening, and we try to find ways to optimize this. How do you do it? Then you can put that into an algorithm that uh, takes care of automatically adjusting your, your network to cope with that. And these are just a few areas where we could define algorithms, right? To cope with uh, better coverage, uh, handle interference, load, mobility, speed, quality, and seems silly, but it's very important, routine work. We do a lot of uh, downloading stuff from this uh, database, getting this other from this other database, correlating, creating a report, all that could be automated. So there's a lot of uh, lost time in, in those routing works. So um, I've been talking a lot about the network. I'm, you know, I'm on the network side of the house, but lately I've been more and more involved into, into the bigger perspective of how all the network components 
including device, have a, a significant impact on your network. So now that's another challenge. We cannot just, you know, before you used to be just an, a run engineer or a core engineer, uh, IP uh, transport. Now you, you know, in order to do a good job, you, you need to have an end-to-end -end perspective on how things work. You know, because however you design a certain application actually affects your RF uh, capacity. And this is what I'm, I'm going to be talking about in the next section. This is uh, to put things in perspective. What happens when we had all these nice smartphones and people started to develop a lot of applications for these open uh, platforms is that, well, the application developers didn't really care about the network. So they, they were designing apps. Even the OS was not very much aware of, of what strains can be put in the network. So they were just designing applications and operating systems based on the PC model, the wired uh, internet model. And you know that actually is not very good for us. And the reason is a lot of these applications have been designed in a chatty manner, meaning that they get a hold of the channel for only a small amount of time and, and then they release it. And you know what? <laughs> the networks have been designed to transmit a lot of data, but not to transmit only a little bit of data. So that, you know, believe it or not, is not good. And it's not good for several reasons. One of them is you're not fully utilizing the air interface. The other is you're doing a lot of signaling in the network that ultimately can cause strains in your system. So what is a chatty application? A chatty application is an application that sends a small amount of data, like 15 kilobytes, every you know, minute or a few minutes. Uh, this is one example of uh, one chatty app. And uh, here we, we were comparing uh, two different weather applications that you install in your phone. You don't know it's there, but you know, we as an operator, we know it's there because <laughs> this application is constantly sending data. Uh, so maybe you're not even looking at the phone. You don't even care what the weather is like, but the application tries to always keep up. So in case you look at the phone, it will tell you what's the weather. That's not very efficient, right? And in this case, there are two different weather applications. The first one is sending one update every hour. And still, it's a very small amount of data. The other application is sending uh, 30 kilob kilobytes of data every six minutes. So imagine everybody that I know has a weather application in their phone. When you have a phone that is sitting idle and all of them have a weather application, if all of them are sending small amount of data, you're really utilizing the network for something that is not even useful. So that's uh, one of the challenges. Um, so there are two, two major limitations or, or challenges from these chatty apps. The first one is they transmit only a, a small, small packet, right? So when they transmit small packets and you have big pipes, what you are doing is you're wasting the resource. So you get a, a few bytes and you are, you know, you're packing it into a, a, a much bigger block that you need to transmit because the protocol has been defined that way, the radio protocol. So you are actually sending dummy data over the air interface. And that's, you know, that's actually going to have an impact in the overall spectral efficiency. The figures that I, I was showing before of spectral efficiency is the typical figures that, uh, that everybody does using certain network simulators. And network simulations are typically based in what's called full buffer. And full buffer means that you transmit data all the time. And then you start putting users, transmitting data all the time. But you don't care you know, what is the quality of that user. You just verify 
that the system is not blocking or that there is no admission control failures, etc. right? But the reality is different. The reality is you need to satisfy a certain quality. It is not acceptable to have users transmitting data at a very slow pace. You want to get your smartphone, open your web page, and have it in a decent amount of time. That you know, may be subjective, but you cannot wait for six minutes to get a, a web page downloaded. So those two aspects, you know, the fact that you are padding a, a radio blocks and the fact that you need to satisfy certain quality uh, requirements actually take down those spectral efficiency figures that we were uh, showing before. And in reality, the capacity of the systems is much lower than that because of this uh, application paradigm. But it's not only the radio spectrum that is suffering. As I was saying before, every time you have one of these heartbeats or a small chatty application that is sending a few bytes, what's happening is that the phone was in a, what we call an idle state or a dormant state, and you need to trigger a transition of the radio states. This is a, an example of the transition of the state transition diagram for, for HSPA. So you would be in idle state, and if you get the minimum amount of data, you would go into the cell DCH state. Uh, cell DCH is the most effective or efficient uh, state in the network. In that state, you can transmit full data uh, at the higher speeds, but the problem is you're consuming network resources, you're consuming baseband. So you cannot have everybody in this state, plus that consumes a lot of battery. So the network has been designed to have these multiple states where you know, only when you need it, you are in that state, then you go into a, another one. Uh, so, once you have sent your small packet, then you go to cell FAT. And then after a certain time, you may go into cell PCH if you have it in your network. This is kind of the dormant state. Now, if you happen to have another uh, byte transmission, then you need to go again and complete the circle. Every time you do these kind of transmissions, there are a ton of radio messages that are sent through the network and that is causing a strain in the processing units in the, in the network elements. In particular, the RNCs in this case were the ones that they were mostly affected. So this is an example of how this uh, application signaling can, can really shift your capacity problem from a throughput capacity problem into a processing load capacity problem. And there are side effects from this chattiness. You know, these applications that are sending, you know, that are kind of transitioning between states, uh, the system was not designed for that. It was not thought for that. Uh, so this is a particular example we, we run in our network, uh, you know, some time ago, where you had uh, 10, 15 users doing FTP downloads and the network was great. You were downloading, and then you would say, OK, the throughput per user is the overall capacity divided by the number of users. Perfect. System calls with that, no worries. But if you have the same amount of users doing a lot of web browsing, what happens is that this web browsing is creating a lot of transitions between the states, and that state transitions actually, uh, in the case of HSPA, happen in, in, a, in a channel that is shared. And then you were getting collisions in that uh, random access channel. There was a power raise, and there were spikes in noise. Those noise spikes were killing your capacity. So a network that was designed to cope with a lot of traffic, suddenly, just because your traffic profile changes, even you're, you're not transmitting a lot of data, you're, you're putting a lot of strain in the system. You can uh, you can fix this through parameter optimization, uh, but the best way is really to have uh, a smart device that tries not to do these continuous transitions. So if you're doing a web browsing session, for example, there's no point in, in going back and forth in the state. You know that 
the traffic profile in a web page is so that you know, you're getting a, a main object and then you're going to be getting small objects, right? So until you have finished downloading all your small objects, you shouldn't be transitioning into an idle state. But who, who, can, who has the key to that is the developer of the application as well as the operating system. There are a lot of opportunities to optimize how these two systems are implemented in order to, to be nice to the, to the system and therefore have a higher or better performance. And of course, there are things that we can do on the radio side. There are features that have been developed, like CPC, uh, but there is still more work that needs to be done. Kind of approaching or making the, the radio layers more aware of the nature of the applications. If we can achieve that, then you can make smarter decisions about how you, you handle your radio uh, channel. Another example of how an application can have a significant uh, impact on your, on your network capacity is a, it's a test that we ran not long ago. With, uh, we had the same device and we, we loaded two different video applications. And in this video application, we were watching the same movie, Limitless in particular. So we were trying to figure out, OK, what is the, the typical bit rate that these uh, applications are using? What is the quality of the, of the video? What was the battery consumption? And what was the pattern of uh, channel utilization for these two applications? I was surprised to see you know, real big differences between these two applications. The quality was about the same, there was no major difference, but this application one was consuming 450 megabytes, while this other application for the same movie was consuming 250 megabytes. So, you know, big difference in terms of, of your overall network capacity because, as you may know, video is becoming more and more the, the bigger uh, the bigger service in terms of consumption in the networks. I read uh, some time ago that I think globally it's uh, about 50% for, for wireless operators. In our case, it's close to that. Uh, so if you, if you implement a better video application, you can have a, a huge impact on your, on your network capacity. And of course, that will translate into having a better customer satisfaction because you know with with this ap application number 1 or with this application number 2 you could be serving two customers with the same amount of resources that you're using for application number 1 and there there was also some interesting findings in terms of battery and signaling so this application was very chatty it was sending a lot of a lot of data going back and forth. So after you watch the whole movie, your battery life went less than half of, of a full charge, while the other movie was coping much better with it. Plus the benefit, apart from the user experience in terms of battery, is that you're putting less signaling strain on the network. You know, and finally, uh, just uh, some opportunities for uh, cross-layer optimization. Now, as I was mentioning, the paradigm has shifted a little bit uh, in terms of having a phone that was voice-centric to having a phone that is application-centric. Now, people want to have a good experience on their applications, but we are just now starting to realize of what that means. You know, before people were saying, okay, I want to have a good data experience and as an operator you only had a certain metrics in your network to evaluate whether the data experience is good. I mean, normally you would look at throughput, maybe you would look at latency, and then from that on you would say, oh, yeah, I think things are good. But the reality of things is data is not one application. Data is a lot of applications. It really depends on what application you're talking about. So we, we need to change that, that paradigm 
uh, from one to multiple and then look at each application individually. We need to take one by one, I mean, we cannot take the 10,000 applications that are in the marketplace, but the key applications that the customers care about, you know, web browsing, video streaming, uh, radio streaming, email, we can take those applications and figure out what, what really uh, the customer cares about this application. Sometimes you don't, you don't need to have a, a fast, uh, you know, a fast transmission. Like if you're just getting your email, you just care that the email gets in time, but it doesn't have to be transmitting at uh, 20 megabits per second. On, the other, on other cases like uh, video or video chat, you actually care that you can transmit the packet in time, otherwise the delay is really noticeable and people don't like the quality. So, so there is a shift in paradigm about trying to get into the device specific or the application specific uh, KPIs. First of all, there is a challenge to kind of capture those from the macro side, but the two worlds kind of need to join in and get some information from each other. So the application layer and the radio layers, they need to come together and with the proper awareness of how the other system works, then uh, design an optimum experience for the customer. And that's what it is about. And this is just, a, you know, just to illustrate with an example, typical web browsing. I mean, everybody uses web browsing and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with how a web uh, download sequence works, but what you would do is you take, you open your browser and you enter the web address. Well, right before you do anything, uh, your phone has to change the radio state. So depending on how big the, well, in order to change that radio state, there has to be data coming from the phone requesting that web page, right? But uh, the first uh, request that comes out of the phone is a DNS. Uh, you are asking for what is the IP address corresponding to www.youtube.com, and the server will reply to you, okay, it's a 192 point blah, 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 okay? And then after that, you do an HTTP get, and you start to get all the packets. Uh, one by one. So just right there at the beginning, when you do the DNS request, you need to do a state transition. So there is an, a, an important effect of the radio protocols in there. Then if, if your radio is not, is not working fine, that DNS lookup time may take a long time. And then your, your experience as a customer is, well, this, this sucks. You know, it's too slow. But, uh, but once you, you have gone that, uh, that stage, you will go one by one the downloading the different packets, right? The different objects in the web page. You will, you will have images, you will have text, maybe some advertisement uh, over here and there. And you would normally have uh, multiple requests going on in parallel to the different places where these objects are. And, you know, at that point, your radio transmission matters, but it, it matters even more what is your network latency. So, it, because HTTP uses the TCP protocol, you are going to have to be acknowledging each of the packets. If your network latency is very, is very high, you're not going to be able to acknowledge uh, the packets in time, and you're going you're gonna to have to uh, wait before you can issue, oh, sorry, new, new request on, on other objects. So it's a complicated thing. We, you know, it's, uh, there are multiple dimensions that needs to be considered. The radio, if you happen to be in a poor radio condition or a good radio condition, the state transitions, your transport delay, uh, what protocol you use, and ultimately also how your browser is designed. There was a nice paper we read not long ago from uh, Penn State University, and they had done a complete revamping of, uh, 
of how the web objects were downloaded from, from the browser. And you know, it was very smart because they figured that, well, the, the mobile phone is taking a long time to run JavaScript so, and to render the page. So I'm going to optimize the way I put my object request so I fully utilize the, the radio transmission before I move into rendering, for example. So a lot of opportunities in this area. This is just an example from one application, but this can be done in, in all the applications. You know, need to go into the microscopic level having this cross-layer uh, information. And you know, finally, just to, to recap the things that uh, I've been talking about and, and provide some opportunities for you guys in case you're looking for research opportunities. Uh, so there are research opportunities, of course, always in new access technologies. We are always on the lookout for improving the spectral efficiency, uh, you know, multiplying the number of antennas or doing that in a practical way because at one point device limitations matter. You cannot put eight antennas on a device this size, right? Uh, but there are different MIMO techniques that are being explored. There's multi-user MIMO that is coming in the standards. Uh, there are advanced receivers that uh, can cancel interference from, from certain sectors. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Wi-Fi offload, I think it's a, it's a very interesting area that needs to progress in order to be feasible and, and realistic and to provide a good, uh, a good method. To, to relieve the, the capacity strain. So there has to be a smarter Wi-Fi selection. We need, as an operator, you want to keep control over the quality of your service. So it has to be a smart selection of what can use Wi-Fi versus what cannot, right? Then, of course, self-organizing networks, there are a lot of opportunities for new algorithm development. You know, every operator will have their own thing, uh, but any, anything that an engineer can do, and if he has to repeat it a few times, that's uh, worth to be automated. And then finally, uh, having more efficient application uh, transmission, and not only in terms of, of the throughput they utilize, but also uh, considering the, the final user experience. So considering how the wireless uh, link is special as compared to the wireline, considering the specific limitations that we suffer, if we develop applications, keeping that in mind, or even the OS is, is implements uh, smart policies around that, then uh, that's going to be beneficial for, for all of us. So with this, uh, you know, I wanted to thank you for attending and if you have any any questions I'll be glad to address those. <laughs>
with the, uh, after like a, a natural, let's say an earthquake or something, is there a provision to prioritize, you know, a 911 call above somebody posting on Twitter or something? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, when there is a natural disaster, or I guess in case of uh, emergency, is there any provisions in the network to prioritize certain services like a uh, 911? And uh, the answer is yes. So all the systems, there is a, a mandate from the FCC they post on all operators. Uh, of course, 911 has priority, but then, is, then there is also a new, a new thing coming up this called wireless priority services. And that would be for government agen agencies to have higher priority uh, than the rest. Yes. So when I'm reading like, in the industry news, I see a common graph is where you have a plot of costs of revenue from user plus another line showing the cost to actually service the user. And there's, of course, a gap in there showing your profit for the company. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, they're showing that because of the growth of data and everything, basically the cost of service to the user starts growing exponentially, but the revenue you get them still grows linearly, which means you start losing tons of money. Yeah. Okay. So it seems like even with the wireless technology point of view, we're basically almost at the Shannon capacity. You can't keep on adding more and more antennas to these devices because, like you said, you can't put eight antennas on your cell phone. So it seems like something's almost wrong with the business model at this point. I don't know if there's any talks of how you can move forward to the next one or how this will evolve. Yeah, so the question is, and it's a very good question, uh, the data consumption is growing and the actual revenue per user, if not uh, decreasing at least is stable, right? So there will be one point where the margins don't make sense. And what is it that we are thinking about doing, etc. cetera? Uh, I cannot comment on everything that, that we are planning because well, that would be, like yeah, but, like yeah, industry in general, what they're, what, you know, what it's been looked at is, is really improving the, the capacity of the system through new technologies. So LT was an attempt to to maintain the profitability of the, of the system because now the price per megabyte really goes down. So everything is tied to cost. I, I guess, you know, as engineers, you, you have to be half uh, economic, right? So you have to, uh, you know, your, your price per megabyte is ultimately tied to your spectrum utilization. Uh, and if you can use your spectrum twice as efficiently as before, then suddenly your price per megabyte can almost half, right? So that way, it's a way to, to keep the margins and you know, make it a, a healthy business. But there are other ways that uh, you know, in the industry is exploring. There are uh, QoS mechanisms. There are uh, partnerships with content providers uh, and a lot of you know, trying to change the business model. But ever since I've been in this industry, <laughs> that question has been there. Uh, there is always this comment about we don't want to be the dump pipe, but so far I haven't seen anything that changes that. Right? So being practical, the, the best tool we have in our hand is to try and, and make the transmission more efficient. And to try and have you know, the developers and the operating system realize that this is a partnership. That you know, they, they have a stake in having the user satisfied. If the network capacity explodes, or if the network demand explodes and there is no capacity to serve that, the experience of using Facebook or using Netflix is going to be so bad that people are not going to want to use those applications. So we, you know, we all need to come to terms and say, well, let's do something that is beneficial for all, for all of us. Uh, in case you still have more questions or you want to talk with Pablo about uh, some uh, job opportunity or intern opportunities uh, in T-Mobile, uh, this afternoon, 1 to 2 p.m. in the Paul Allen Center, this is a main office of WE 107. In case you are interested in talking with Pablo more about this, please stop by 107 in the main office. Okay.
Oh, 105? Oh, OK. All right, so um, 105. So in case you want to stop by, just feel free to stop by. No, no reservation needed. You just walk in. OK. Any more questions? No? OK, thank you. Thank you.